This is Susan Bassey. I want to take you to Richmond, California on a First Amendment audit that started back in 2016 and has been three years in the making. And I want to show you what it looks like to exercise your First Amendment right to seek redress, to complain to your government about law enforcement, judges, or lawyers. And I want to show you what it looks like when individuals in the government retaliate because you exercise those First Amendment rights. Yes, good morning. I was wondering if you could tell me if Joe Sweeney is being processed. Okay, so, so I'm in the right area. Okay, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Alice. Can wait in here. just a little bit of jail, and if that's necessary, then so be it. It was on this day that I met Joe Sweeney, and shortly after this interview, I went into the courtroom before Bruce Mills, where Joe Sweeney was jailed for posting online about his divorce from attorney Carrie Evelsizer. And it was Miss Evelsizer's contention that Joe's postings online caused her extreme emotional distress. And for the 16 days that Joe was in jail, I interviewed his friends and his family, and I gathered other sources from the Richmond area related to all the issues involving police misconduct and what was going on in our family and criminal courts. And then armed with my baked goods, I set off to the jail on the day that Joe was scheduled to be released on a Sunday morning at 7 a.m. And there were no reporters, photographers, or journalists there that day to address the First Amendment issues of a father being jailed for posting online about his divorce case or for him seeking redress when he petitioned the state legislature to oversee the agency that watchdogs judges in the state. Mainstream media was busy with other judges and with the Richmond police sex scandal at that time. and offered to go to drug rehab, which is the latest twist in this ongoing sex scandal involving police departments in the Bay Area. As Crown Forest Hazik Badun reports tonight, the offer to go to rehab made by the Richmond Police Department has been rejected by the woman at the center of the scandal. You going to Miami? I rejected it. This is a text I got today from 18-year-old Celeste Guap regarding the Richmond Police Department offering to get her help at a drug treatment center in Miami, Florida. She says that the offer came Wednesday when an RPD sergeant brought her here to the West Contra Costa County Family Justice Center, a one-stop multi-service center for victims of sexual and human trafficking abuse. I asked her, do you feel like RPD was just trying to get you out of town? She wrote, yeah, LOL. Police agencies that have officers who are accused of misconduct with her, they should not be involved with her on in, on in any circumstances. Civil rights attorney John Burris has been following the Bay Area-wide police sex scandals involving Celeste Guap. He explains why there is a conflict of interest for Richmond police in this scenario. Uh, that could easily be viewed as an obstruction of justice way. You're trying to interfere with the witness who may have uh, testimony that would be hurtful to someone within your department. And as we waited for Joe Sweeney to be processed and released from the jail that morning, we had plenty of time to talk to people who were visiting inmates in custody and to deputies who wanted to speak off the record about issues relating to the sex scandal involving the Richmond Police Department and issues relating to the recall of Judge Aaron Persky down in Santa Clara County. Because as there was a grand swell movement to recall Judge Persky, nobody could believe that mainstream media wasn't covering the issue of Judge Bruce Mills jailing a father on First Amendment issues and then calling into the jail to make sure that he wouldn't be released early.
an issue that would ultimately have Judge Bruce Mills retire, maintaining his pension on his way out. Judge Persky, on the other hand, was not able to maintain his pension after he was recalled two years later. From a felony to a misdemeanor. Last year, the judge said he could consider the idea if the plumber stayed sober. Is Judge Persky a good judge? Uh, he's, a, he's a good judge. And, uh, you know, he, he's reflective of the judges that we have. But he made a mistake county. in this case, but Absolutely. he's a good judge. Absolutely. While on the one hand, I was angry and sad, I wasn't surprised. And the reason I wasn't surprised is I've been a prosecutor here for more than 20 years. Actually, the reason he wasn't surprised is because he's a corrupt prosecutor and he knew about the existence of this record. A record that evidenced three of his employees, Casey Halcone, Sahir Stefan, and Netta Redman, moved the victim, known as Celeste Guap, out of state where she could not testify against the police officers who had sexually assaulted, raped, and sodomized her while she was underage. And Mr. Rosen also knew, based on numerous complaints from employees, that these two who had trafficked the victim out of state were involved in an improper sexual relationship themselves, a relationship that Mr. Rosen looked the other way on and that would ultimately bring attention back to Mr. Rosen's office. Sympathy from Judge McGowan this morning. And how is it that you're representing Mr. Stefan? Are you aware that he's in bankruptcy court and that he says he only has $100 worth of clothing? And Mr. Hammond, is it true that you're representing Mr. Stefan for free so that you can get part of a settlement from the county? that you've colluded with Judge Towery and others? Do you have a comment, Mr. Stefan? Mr. Stefan, you cheated taxpayers by having an affair with Netta Wright Redman? Were you having an affair with a subordinate while you were the claims manager for the district attorney's office? Mr. Hammond, are you having your client jaywalk in violation of the law? Mr. Hammond, are you encouraging your client to jaywalk? But Jeff Rosen surely must have known that he was in deep trouble as early as March 1st, 2019, after our team obtained public records, which evidenced over 6,000 emails between Jeff Rosen's office and Stanford law professor, Michelle Dauber. Those emails show that public resources, information, and monies went to Michelle Dauber to assure the re-election of Jeff Rosen and the recall of Judge Persky, a message that was vastly different than the one Jeff Rosen presented to mainstream media during that campaign from 2016 to 2018. But it wasn't until I saw this video of Stanford law professor Michelle Dauber stealing the sign of a protester at one of the rallies that she had organized. And that sign supported the no recall. And Michelle Dauber stole the sign with the assistance and knowledge of the DA's public information officer, Sean Webby. And it was then that I realized that Michelle Dauber and Jeff Rosen had worked together to get a judge recalled and to get Jeff Rosen re-elected. Who are you? I'm with the District Attorney's Office. I'm Sean Webby. Nice to meet no, you. I'm a journalist for 25 years. I believe in freedom of speech. I do. Awesome. Thank you.
And it was on this day that things didn't just seem unfair or unjust. They seemed outright corrupt. That's a good word. The word amongst the guards or the inmates? Or everybody? Well, yeah, the guards and then the inmates. So that was... Was was that you pissed off a judge? But Joe Sweeney didn't just piss off one judge. He angered many judges because it was his reports, his public comments, and his petitioning the government seeking redress of his grievances related to judicial misconduct in the state of California that resulted in the first audit of the state watchdog that looks over judge discipline issues in order to protect the public. And it was the first audit in over 55 years. And Joe Sweeney was not wrong because the auditor agreed with what Joe had said in his initial reports and so much more. The public is not being protected in California when it comes to bad judges engaging in misconduct in California's courts. And two days after the state legislature ordered the audit on the state's judicial watchdog, Carrie Evelsizer appeared outside the courthouse. She didn't look like a victim who was relieved that an abuser had been put in jail for her protection. Instead, she looked like an attorney who was pleased with herself for having gamed the system and putting her former husband in jail through a family court proceeding. And she did so with her money, her power, and her influence and all the experts she could afford to buy. And ironically, as Joe Sweeney was jailed for what was arguably First Amendment issues, his former father-in-law threatened my life and the life of my photographer out on a public sidewalk, an issue the Contra Costa County District Attorney never felt inclined to investigate or prosecute. And after Joe Sweeney was released from jail that day, We went up the hill to meet some of my favorite whistleblowers in the small little town of Kensington, where I have a number of connections that I've had for the last 35 years. It is the home of Daniel Ellsberg, the famous whistleblower of the Pentagon Papers during the Vietnam War. And my researchers recently found that Ward Penfold moved to Kensington last month. And Ward Penfold might just find that this small little town of Kensington, California, isn't going to take too kindly to cops and lawyers violating the First Amendment rights of people connected to this community. And maybe Mr. Penfold's been busy in those community meetings because he hasn't had time to get back to me on a reply to my anti-slap lawsuit that was filed against Casey Halcone, who Ward Penfold is representing in that case. I will sign the order to allow me to go to public buildings and courthouses without any restraint. And you can have your little people who are all upset. Give them all the protection you want. That's three down, Mr. Penfold. We have nine more First Amendment lessons to go.